Joining us now is the host of The Ingram Angle, a Fox News show that premieres, and we're grateful that it's premiering on October 30th. It'll be at 10 p.m. Eastern, right here in the same building, by the way. Laura's also the author of a new book called Billionaire at the Barricades. Laura Ingram joins us tonight on the set. Good to see you, Tucker. Great to see you, Laura. The idea of a federal investigation into, excuse me, sexual abuse in Hollywood seems a little out of left field, and then you see the context for it, which is ample. There have been a lot of investigations along these lines and in different sectors of our society and economy. Why not Hollywood? Colleges, universities, corporate America. Exactly. And, and there's a lot of resources put into those investigations. There are a lot of young lawyers hired to work aggressively in those investigations. And when you, when you really hear the, the, the comments of obviously the New Yorker piece and, and the now descriptions 20 years later from really powerful women, women who today are worth hundreds of millions of dollars, kind of finally come out and tell this story. I, I, I think a lot of young women kind of ask the question, you know, how did this, how, how was this tolerated? How was not only this tolerated over decades, but if I had heard about it in 1999, That's which right. I did from friends who know him well, that I didn't even, I mean, who am I? But I knew about it. Like, so if I knew about it, everyone knew about it. So this idea that, oh, I'm shocked, I'm appalled, come on. But how could this come have happened on. there? This didn't take place in some Trump voting zip code in right. West Virginia. This took place at the very center, the beating heart of American liberalism. And feminism, American feminism. Where, exactly. Where this so, is all about do, women are, are, are strong and powerful and diverse. And isn't this great to have women in all these positions? And, and, the, and the, first of all, women aren't in a lot of positions in Hollywood. They're not in top executive positions. I, I do think it, the way age is used to disqualify women from roles is disturbing. I frankly do think it's disturbing. And I think the pornification of the culture at the hands of a lot of these executives is something that our kids are dealing with, that are, is going to, the fallout of that we're going to be dealing with for generations. This has been going on for decades. So I don't think, I mean, I, I can't imagine anyone's really surprised by this. Like, I, I but mean, how can you say with a straight face that you care about women when you abet and excuse and hide behavior like this? Well, that went out, actual. Yeah, but that went, out the, that went out the door, didn't it? With Roman Polanski, it went out the door when Bill Clinton you know, raped Juanita Broderick, according to her, and she was a very extremely credible woman, Kathleen Willey. Uh, you know, obviously Paula Jones. I mean, they stood by him. He was in the Oval Office with a, with a 22 year old girl. But then, why do they still wield moral authority when well, they don't? That Trump called them. Trump Trump's called them out. He's called them to the carpet on this stuff. And I but think they intimidate on, the hell out of corporate America. Well, they do, and you know, they throw it back on Trump because of the Billy Bush tape and all that. But I, I think women now today, especially today, they've gotten stronger. They've gotten smarter. Uh, I hope after all of this, it, when we say, well, let's have a conversation, well, let's have a real honest conversation about how all of this goes down and how when you have power and you have money and you have an Oscar dangling in the background, you can get away with a lot. Yeah, and, and, and when and, you're and giving frankly, money to the politicians. And, and frankly, there are men and women who knew this was going on for a long time. What I find confusing, though, is here you have Michelle Obama on tape describing Harvey Weinstein as a wonderful person. Now, even if you didn't know, I worked for American Harvey Weinstein hero. briefly. Not a wonderful mm -hmm. person. That was really obvious. She sends her daughter to intern for him. And then for five days, the Obamas say nothing. How can that be? Well, can you imagine if the shoe were on the other foot? I mean, they would be dragging Republicans through the mud every day. Like, where is your moral conscience? How about Jimmy Kimmel? Jimmy Kimmel has the self-anointed moral conscience of America. You know, tr trashing Trump after the Charlottesville, they, Obamacare, whatever it was. I mean, in every issue now, he's the pundit of the day. It took him a little time to come along to yeah, com commenting on this as well. So, look, if you're going to be holding yourself out as this moral arbiter, okay, then, you know, I, don't, I, I think everyone's flawed. I think, I, I think there are a lot of hands that are unclean. I, I agree. I so agree use that bad that. analogy. Yeah, but that's not something topic. you hear from the Oscar podium. Yeah. You've written a book called Billionaire at the Barricades, which I think is really smart. And it puts the last election into a context, a continuum in American politics. What, how do you describe it? Uh, it's, a, it's a conservative populism that obviously Ronald Reagan really tapped into in 1976. Even Richard Nixon, when he talked about the silent majority, yes. a return to law and order, he was very concerned about big media, big business. The bigness of corporations, political structures, bureaucracies, when those grow, individual freedom retreats. And we all become less free and less independent. So uh, Donald Trump 
tapped into that long strain of conservative populism, which in the modern day uh, was really invigorated by Reagan. And, and we really have not had a national victory since 2004 before Trump came along. George Bush went off the rails in 2006 with Harriet Myers and immigration amnesty and uh, Ted Kennedy, working with Ted Kennedy on the, uh, you know, the Medicare Part D. So he, he went way beyond where I think people thought he was originally going to go, which was kind of a more pragmatic, a slightly populist conservatism. But Trump saw that opening and he just took it. And that was really smart. Then if this is part of a longstanding tradition, and I think you make a really compelling case that it is, why was everyone in Washington so confused by this? Well, they were stunned. Like, well, this, this guy won because of the Russians or Comey or Hillary's a bad candidate. What they didn't understand is that he won actually because of the issues. He was a little brash and sometimes he's kind of a wrecking ball, but the people were so sick of being kicked to the curb on issues of trade, deindustrialization in the Midwest, open borders, a, a constant military intervention at the hands of Republican presidents, uh, that they were, they're just like, look, he's our bully. We need someone to bully the bullies. And Trump came along and said, look, it's going to be America first in trade and foreign policy and deregulation. I'm going to put your interests first. And that was... That was like startling for people to hear. But why would it be? I mean, I, I think it's a it's a brilliant book and it's a really smart point. But it also, if you think about it for 10 minutes, you might come to that well, conclusion. Pat, why did nobody? Yeah. Well, because there's a lot of money involved. Back to back to money. Money talks. Yes. And and big donors with big interests like to keep wages low in the United States because they make more money. And and from Margaret Thatcher to, to President Reagan to Donald Trump, they knew that if you, if you crush small business in the United States, if you crush that middle class, the working class spirit that I came from, you crush that for long enough, that something's going to blow. Yeah. And something, something is going to you know, erupt in politics. And Donald Trump erupted onto the scene. And, and we'll see if he, you know, he can take this over the finish line. There are a lot of barricades in front of him, that's for sure. I can't believe you're coming at 10 o'clock. That's going to be great. We're going to have fun. <laughs> we're gonna, it's going to be gonna pa great. We're going to pass, like, we're not going to do the football, the Hannity football. I already told him we're not going to do that. We're going we're to have to pass something from box to box. That's I don't know. Be awesome. Lauren